Okay, so, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, before I get started, I want to thank you guys all for coming. In some ways, this seminar is long overdue. I've been here actually since 2015, late 2015, and um, my presence on campus has grown and grown, and um, the scheduling to give a seminar, a proper seminar, never worked out, but um, I'm happy to do so now. Um, I've really enjoyed the sort of welcoming community I've found, um, especially the fisheries group here is really awesome. So thank you, Olaf, for giving me a home in your lab group, and thanks to John and Malin and all of the fisheries folks around, as well as just the department and Diener and the other folks I've met through marine science. Um, it was kind of a slightly random circumstance I wound up here, but um, I could not have landed in a better place. So thanks for that. Um, so today, my job is to introduce you to what I'm interested in, what I think about, and how I approach problems. So like many of you, uh, I'm interested in general questions in biology, like why are there so many species? Specifically, I like to think about why complex life history traits of species evolve. And increasingly, like many of us, I'm interested in knowing which species are going to survive human-driven changes that are happening now and will continue, um, which colloquially, colloquially we have started to call the Anthropocene in conservation biology and in other disciplines. And more specifically, how can we help those species? Can we prevent any species extinctions? Can we, can we support the species that we think are doing okay or need a little help? So my interests are from specific questions about the connections between life history, demography, and population dynamics, so really ecological in focus, which is what I'm going to be talking mostly about today. Um, I'm interested in mechanistic models of life history evolution in ectotherms, like fishes, but also in other uh, animals, invertebrates, and plants. Um, so specifically, I like to think about traits like growth, maturity, lifespan, offspring size and number, and mating systems. Those are always on my mind when I approach a problem. And I'm also looking forward, focused on addressing feedbacks between adaptation to global change and um, current processes in population and community ecology. So, those first three questions I am working on primarily in salmon and the marine fishes I'll talk about today, sharks and rays, tunas and groupers. But I also have a, a back burner project that I hope to revive again one day, and that's on these Corsican wrasses. And they're a really interesting group with a lot of unique social traits, social interactions. Here you see a cleaner cleaning a, a large um, symphonous tinka. These are congeners, the cleaner wrasse and the large wrasse in the picture. And so in that context, I got motivated to think about social traits and interactions as drivers of ecological speciation, specifically in the context of life history and mating system adaptations. So if you're interested in any of those topics or they sound interesting to you, come and talk to me about them. The other thing I want to say in this introductory section is that I use a different methods to address these problems. So in the past, I have been a field biologist. I have done lab experiments. But these days, again, um, be largely because of coincidence, uh, I spend most of my time doing either peer theory or computational models in front of a computer. So um, again, I try to be broad in how I approach problems, and I try to address questions that can be answered in multiple systems. And today I'm going to talk to you about my research addressing how fisheries are changing in the Anthropocene. And so I like to start with this really um, frequently cited graph from the FAO, the last um, report on the status of the world's fisheries and oceans. So this graph basically gives you the uh, status of the around 2,000 species that the FAO keeps track of and uh, whether their fisheries are uh, overexploited, fully fished, or underexploited. And so the really common statistic that people like to say is like, okay, 90% of the world's fisheries are, that we're at, we're at 90% here now, if you ex extrapolate beyond 2013, are either fully fished or overfished. 
suggesting that we are at the limit of, we are approaching the limit of the amount of biomass that we can extract from the ocean. But, so that's a really commonly cited statistic. What I like to think about though is uh, who are those species? And yeah, there's around 2,000 of them, but the, rea the reality is that the vast majority of what we catch and eat globally are just 10 species. Those species are tunas, mackerels, cod, herring, sardines, and anchovies. So what is it about those 10 species that make them so productive that they can support uh, such a large fraction of the global catch biomass? So think about that. And then the other thing I like to point out about this graph is um, there's a lot missing here, and those are the species that we don't have the data on. Those are the species that we know the least about. We know they're fished because we see them in fish markets, but their catch is not recorded, they're not assessed. We don't know how their populations are changing over time, and some of them are going extinct. So those are species that tend to be caught in indiscriminate fisheries. Maybe they're caught as bycatch. Their catch is not identified. They're, not, they're discarded and not reported. Maybe they are recorded, but they're fished illegally as well. And there's other like little loopholes. So there are, there's a real potential in marine fishes for species to just slip through the net, so to speak. Because we don't know how to monitor and keep record of how they're doing over time. I'd like to use this picture to illustrate this point, um, because this is a port on the South China Sea where the government uh, closed the local fishery for three months in order to improve uh, fish population health. So this was a, a, a management measure. It was a, a seasonal closure. And so this is the day the fishery reopened. You can see the fleet leaving port. And um, it's hard to get a sense of the scale here, but this is, this is quite a large bridge. And the thing that I just want you to realize is these are huge uh, ships, and there are a lot of them. OK, so this is, you know, really emblemizes the amount of fishing, that the degree of fishing pressure that our oceans are experiencing today. And in some ways, for some species, this is a more pressing concern than even climate change in the marine uh, environment. But I don't want to only pick on Southeast Asia and their industrial fleet. We have this problem locally. To some extent, we have a fishery for skate wing um, that currently is doing big business because skate wing are uh, very popular as bait in lobster traps. And as you might know, lobster is booming right now in the Gulf of Maine. But these skate are landed as skate NEI, meaning not otherwise, uh, not elsewhere indicated. So that basically means we're not recording the species. We only got the wing. There are up to six. Most of the catch is little skate, but we don't actually know uh, how those other species are doing over time and if our catch composition is shifting. So I would argue that as conservation biologists and ecologists and managers, we have two challenges. <clears throat> we need to develop sustainable fisheries policy when data are limited. And this is hard to do. Um, Things like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, things like um, quantitative criteria for CITES or IUCN uh, red list assessments, these are all um, political efforts that rely on a quantitative number in order to trigger a threshold to, to, um, to, to engender some management action. And if we don't have the data available to meet those thresholds or to even make a case um, we're kind of crippled. And this is true locally and globally when we're trying to, ski, to triage species health. Of course, we have the second challenge, which as an evolutionary ecologist is near and dear to my heart, and that is understanding and managing species with different life histories, right? That's where the cool biology comes in. So these are the two things that I try to do in my work. So at this point, I like to ask my audience a question just to, um, to give you a sense of why this is a hard problem. Okay, so I'm presenting here two uh, fish species, bluefin tuna and blue shark. They are both pelagic predators, and they have very similar body length, age and maturity, and lifespan. They are, of course, different in that bluefin tuna produce millions of offspring every time they spawn, and blue sharks are live bearers, so they produce 
maybe hundreds of pups over their lifetime. So just if you had a, a gut feeling, which one of these do you think is going to be more susceptible to overexploitation? Okay, tunas, raise your hand. Okay, blue shark, anyone? Oh, okay, interesting. Okay, that's great. Well, the other thing I should tell you is that tunas, bluefin tuna, are the most expensive fish in the world. Because of that, we have a lot of data on their population trajectories. We have incredibly strong management measures. We know they're overfished. We actually know exactly how much they're overfished at any given time. <laughs> or we try. We really try. Blue shark, by contrast, often caught by tuna fleets, longliners. Um, they're the most commonly landed sharks. They're the most common fin in the fin trade. But we have very few data on their population trajectories over time. And it's been very, very hard to implement limits on blue shark catch. Okay. So, I don't actually know the answer to the question that I pose in this slide, but we're going to get to it later in the talk, so keep that in mind. So today I'm, I'm really going to talk about um, two questions I've tried to address recently. The first is how do we predict population productivity from life history traits in the sense the exercise that we just did? And the second one is can Robin Hood models of related species trajectories inform or even uh, produce assessments of data poor species. Okay, and so starting with the first, how do we predict population productivity from life history traits? So in fisheries, um, we have a really good sense of population dynamics over time. And we depend on measures of individual size. And, and fecundity that we get from catching old or catching females and measuring the relationship between size and egg production. So that gives us a handle on what to feed into our ecological models of population dynamics in terms of birth rates. However, we have a more difficult problem when we're trying to measure mortality rates. It's very difficult to actually measure mortality. You can infer it from something like mark recapture data. That kind of data is incredibly rare in fisheries and marine fisheries. And so a lot of times we are left with a guess when we're parameterizing our assessment models or what natural mortality rate actually is. This is where I think life history traits can actually be a very uh, useful source of information and intuition. So we know a lot about how fish life histories and life histories in general evolve. Uh, we have a, this canon of classic life history theory to draw on. And we know a few things about fish specifically and in general. We know that high size dependent juvenile mortality uh, selects for larger offspring. Okay, this is actually a result that, that I worked on as a postdoc at UBC. Um, I was briefly in Sally Otto's lab there. This is something that makes a lot of intuitive sense, but was very difficult to show. And so we kind of we kind of did the theory after I think everyone kind of agreed on the idea. Um, but we also know that high and variable juvenile mortality select for increased lifespan and greater fecundity. This is known as the storage effect. It's also applied um, to seed banks and plants. And we know that high adult mortality selects for earlier maturity. So we know this from really nice experimental studies on things like guppies and sword tails. And we also know it from the fisheries-induced evolution literature on cod. Okay, so we can say something about mortality, the relationship between mortality and life history traits. And we can actually, in my mind, make these pretty simple relationships. We think as adult mortality increases, age and maturity will decrease. And as juvenile mortality increases, actually, as if we see an organism with high fecundity, we can infer that juvenile mortality is relatively high. Now, the reason for that is that over evolutionary time, we know that for a population to be stable and for a species to persist, females on average are replacing themselves and their mate, if they have a mate. So that means that for a bluefin tuna that spawns 3 million eggs every time, every day that she spawns, yeah, she's going to have pretty low per offspring survival on average, if, if only one or maybe two of those survive. Whereas 
uh, something that only produces a few hundred pups in their lifetime, you can infer they have much larger survival just because of that equilibrium requirement. So that means that I can plot species, I can think about where species lie in this trait space given the combinations of fecundity and age maturity that they have. And so in doing this, I'm really paying an homage to a classic paper in fish ecology from 1992 by Weinmiller and Rose. Um, they came up with a triangle of fish life history strategies. <clears throat> Again, I'm trying to do this from a quantitative angle, so I'm plotting my traits on the x and y axis. I have juvenile mortality or fecundity over here, and I have the inverse of agent maturity over here as a proxy for adult mortality. Okay, so it's pretty easy to think of a species that is in the upper right quadrant of my graph here. Um, we call these opportunistic species. They're both small, they mature early, and they have pretty high fecundity. They produce a few thousand eggs. Uh, annually. Down here, we know there are episodic species that have really high fecundity, like groupers, but the adults also mature late, live a long time. These are the episodic species that, ha that are doing the storage effect, right? So they're waiting for that one really good year of recruitment in which they may have a successful progeny actually survive to uh, become a juvenile. In the lower left quadrant, we have survivor species. These are species that have great adult survival, but only a few offspring, so they must also have pretty high juvenile survival. Again, these three categories are straight from the Weinmiller and Rose um, paper, and in some ways, I'm not adding a lot to what they wrote about. But by putting it in this framework, we can see there's a fourth area of our graph. It took me a while to come up with what species might find a marine species, especially in that corner. What's a species that has uh, early maturity, the really high adult mortality, but also has great offspring survival? So eventually, actually, I had to have a seahorse biologist point this out to me. But yeah, seahorses. These are the perfect candidate for being precocial species. That's the term I'm borrowing from the bird literature. So. Uh, Seahorses are iconic for male pregnancy. They had this really extended period of parental investment. After this huge effort by the male to, to nourish those offspring, they pop out, and they are mature in six months to a year. So they have this really incredible lifestyle. And so yeah, species in this quadrant are rare, but they do exist, and they're in freshwater environments as well, like, like guppies are a classic example. Okay, so that's the theory. Where do most fish species fall in this trait space? Well, we have our seahorses and herrings up here. These are a little closer together. I'm, I'm using the log of fecundity here. Sharks and rays, as predicted, are down here in the lower left. And then, yeah, most teleos species are here. Uh, actually, the vast majority of fish species are, are kind of episodic to some degree. So here, here's my grouper. But there's something kind of interesting about this graph, which is there's no species that are over here in this region. This is a wahoo, this is a scombrid that has a, a pretty fast productive lifestyle. And, and so what we're seeing there, I would argue, is just the natural result of an evolutionary constraint. So it's not possible to mature early and achieve the body size necessary to have that really high fecundity that you see in large species like the grouper. So we're gonna come back to that. Just hold that in your mind. It's, this is sort of a, a, an area that's evolutionarily inaccessible, at least to fishes. Okay, so how does the ability to cope with fishing vary among these different life history categories? Well, to answer that question, I used a size and age structured population dynamics that is commonly used in fisheries management. It is the backbone of most fisheries stock assessment software. And it has a lot in common with classic stage structured models in population ecology or, or age structured. So we have a larval pool and we assume there's some density dependent recruitment function. We call these things like Beverton Holt recruitment or Ricker recruitment. Then we assume that recruits begin to grow and mature with given, uh, according to given size-specific functions. They move through these 
we always have a map between age and size in fish called a von Berlanti growth curve. So then once they're mature, they reproduce according to their size, um, according to the size-dependent fecundity function. So I just want to outline this model and emphasize that it's pretty basic and it should be hopefully familiar if you're familiar with um, simple Leslie matrix style um, population models. The difference is that we, all of the density dependence happens here and all of the mortality happens in the age structured portion of the model where we assume um, an annual mortality rate and we can also um, fish them at an annual fishing rate. So instead of doing equations, I'm going to show you what the figures look like for functions for one of my uh, representative species, the, the grouper. Again, I have the von Berlanffy growth function that provides a nice map between age and size. I have a relationship between age and fecundity that comes out of size-specific fecundity and the probability that you're mature at a given age. And then I have a recruitment function it's very difficult to find recruitment functions, and there's a lot of uncertainty in these, in this part. But for reasons that I'll go into later, it doesn't matter as much for the results I'm going to tell you. So essentially, these parameters I, I estimated from the literature values. Um, and with those in place, I can simulate the population dynamics. I start from a very small population. It grows to an equilibrium at which point I start to fish it. It reaches a new fish steady state. Then if I cease fishing, it recovers. Okay, so uh, classic population dynamics with no environmental variability. And this, uh, for now, we're assuming everything is deterministic in this model. From the model, at the steady state, I get the stable age distribution. This is the age structure. My immatures are gray. You can see that the probability they're mature increases with age. And then they, I just assume constant negative exponential um, mortality. If I fish them, my age structure gets truncated. This is classic fisheries. This is actually a sustainable fishery. So this species lives 40 years. Um, and you can see the number of individuals in, in the older age classes gets very small, but I still have some individuals that are living up to 20 years. That's actually really good uh, in the grand scheme of things. And I should say the fishing I'm using here, this is called knife edge selectivity. So this is the probability that you are susceptible to the gear. I'm assuming a gear that selects only for mature fish. So this is I'm a well-managed fishery, let's say. I'm not, I'm not allowing my juveniles to be fished. So I repeat this process for all of my four characteristic species um, in each of my quadrants. And I'm using published life history trait data from the literature. The thing that I'm fudging the most is that natural mortality uh, parameter. We don't have direct estimates of this for hardly anything, even cod. Um, and so I'm using relative values, again, that I'm sort of fudging. But uh, because it's relative, it's not as important as you might think, and I'll, and I'll go into that a little bit. Okay, so. How do we quantify the effect of fishing on population productivity? So, so in a way, it's the compensatory capacity that I'm interested in, the ability of a population to keep up with fishing. Well, the answer is, in fisheries management, calculate a reference point called the spawning potential ratio. And that is a, something that tells you uh, how much fishing mortality has impacted the productivity of the population. So I like to think of the SPR as a little spring. It kind of, the population is a spring. It has the ability to bounce back if you, if you add increased mortality to it. But as the uh, lifetime production of females is decreased, that spring gets less springy. So a ratio that's close to zero means it's got no spring. And a ratio close to one means whatever fishing or additional mortality you've added hasn't really affected the population. Okay, what is lifetime production? Well, it's the larvae produced by each female uh, in the stable age distribution, or it's the lifetime production of a female. Um, and the beautiful thing about the spawning potential ratio and the reason I'm so keen on it is because as long as I keep fishing mortality in check, uh, 
and I'm not fishing the population so hard, we get into an area that's called recruitment overfishing. It means that recruitment is in both the numerator and the denominator of this function, and it kind of cancels. So it means that changing the recruitment function has very little influence on the results I'm about to show you, which is really nice because that's one of the huge unknowns that we, that we don't have um, for most marine species. And then the other thing, the same is true of natural mortality to some extent. Um, it, it influences the outcome, but not as much uh, as I expected initially, and it's because it's affecting both the top and the bottom. Okay, so now I'm going to show you this spawning potential ratio for each of my four characteristic species. Now, again, I want to emphasize that here I'm keeping fishing uh, the same. So I'm using the same fishing coefficient um, in my survival function. So basically, it's, if fishing is equal but all the other traits change, what happens? This graph kind of blew me and my co-authors away. And we all had a prior opinion on how these four species were going to be in terms of their compensatory capacity. And none of us put precocial species uh, over here so far to the right. We were really shocked by that. Yeah, we kind of knew the survivors were going to do badly. We weren't sure how episodic and opportunistic, how different they would be. But again, and we kind of didn't know where precocial would be. The last place we expected was over here, almost at one. So I had to redo this analysis again, convince myself it was right, until I, finally it dawned on me that, yeah, seahorses have uh, extended parental care and they mature in six months to a year. It's dead obvious in hindsight, they are the only species that can keep up with annual fishing mortality because they're, they replace themselves on that time scale. So again, um, this was a useful exercise, I think, for all of us. I think part of the reason it was so shocking is that seahorses were the first marine fishes to be protected on CITES Appendix 2 in the early 2000s. They were protected before any of the shark fin rays, before humphead wrasse, or any of the other really iconic endangered marine fishes. And the reason that was given uh, was because of their biology low productivity. And I think, I'm not, and I, you know, I have mixed feelings about this because I'm not trying to say that seahorses do not deserve to be protected. I do think that they are extremely threatened. They have extremely sensitive habitat. They live in mangroves. They're very close to human uh, sources of fishing and, and they're sensitive, but they also have this incredible capacity to rebound that we don't see in some of these other species. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so to summarize this section, precocial and opportunistic species can compensate for fishing or any other kind of additional mortality um, because of their early age and maturation. Fecundity, kind of irrelevant in this, in this framework. Something that I didn't show you, but that I think is very interesting and uh, I'm following up now, is that if maturation age is equal, then the ability to efficiently convert energy you take in into reproductive output matters the most for your spawning potential ratio. So that is actually a clue uh, as to whether it's bluefin tuna or blue shark that's more susceptible to overexploitation. Because bluefin tuna are incredibly efficient. They're, they're among the most amazing marine fishes in their ability to put on biomass and produce reproductive output. And we will come back to that. And in my equations, the scaling relationships between length, mass, and fecundity are way more important than things like the recruitment function or mortality, which is why I love this approach so much. Okay, so that's really great. That's a nice, uh, that's a nice story. It gives you some qualitative rules of thumb that you can apply if you absolutely don't know anything about your species at risk. But what we really need is a quantitative population assessment of a data-limited fishery or any population. So how do we do that? Now that is a question that I 
thought about for years before I came up with the answer. Um, I finally came up with two ideas. First was to use something called Robin Hood models, which I will tell you about in a second. Basically, in a Robin Hood model, you use phylogenetic proximity in a hierarchical framework to share data from rich to poor species. So you fit the model to multiple species at once. You need to have some data-rich species in your data set. And you can um, weight the distance between the similarity of your predicted dynamics by something like phylogenetic proximity or even spatial um, or um, <clears throat> temporal proximity. It's kind of built in. The second was to use evolutionary ecology to generate Bayesian priors on mortality and density dependence in my Robin Hood model. I decided I wanted to do this for three clades, which differed in their key biology, in their evolutionary age, species number, and the representation of rich and poor species. Because I was so convinced that this idea would work, I, but, I, but, I, but the question is, how well does it work? Does it work better than what we've got now? What is its potential? And how does it interact with the natural variability that we see among species? Especially because I'm leaning heavily, I, I intended when I, when I came up with this idea to lean heavily on phylogenetic signal. Like how much information is there in something like a taxonomic relationship when you're fitting a model? So my three clades, which I picked because they have cool biology, they're heavily fished and overfished, and uh, <clears throat> they're, um, they all have a high representation of both data-rich and poor species. Oh, well, except for this one, huh? Um, were tunas, sharks and rays, and groupers. Now, honestly, I only said groupers because they're tropical and uh, we know almost nothing about them, and yet they are disappearing rapidly. Um, but since I started this project, I found very little, few data available on them. So um, if you want to talk to me about that, I'd be more than happy to hear more. So before uh, I, yeah, and then I also recruited a great team of people to help me do this and actually do most of the heavy lifting. I have co-PIs, um, one in Scotland, Jason Mathopoulos, who's a really excellent statistical ecologist, and Mark Mangle and Nick Dolby are on the West Coast, and they're both really great fisheries biologists. And we have postdocs, Kat Horswell in the UK, Maria, Maria Jose Juan Horta in Spain, and we had a technician, Jamie Yin, for the first year of our project. Um, because, and we've received a bunch of funding for this, because I think people recognize that it's both really ambitious, but also really important. And so we needed resources to pull it off. However, before I talk too much more about um, our case studies and where we are now, I want to take a little digression and talk a little bit about um, Bayesian models and how that statistical approach is similar and different to approaches that might be more familiar to all of you. So I think as scientists, many of us start out with being introduced to statistics through something like linear regression or maybe a t-test or an ANOVA. And this is a framework where we assume that data are normal and we fit our models by this method of least sum of squares. In linear regression, we use a two-parameter model that has a slope and an intercept plus an error term. And we make our inference with p-values. So this, this approach dominated recent scientific um, statistical methods because it was tractable without computers. When we add computers to the mix, we can expand the framework to look at likelihood-based models, such as logistic regression, Really, there's an indefinite number of likelihood-based models you can do. In this example, I'm showing you a case where data are binomial, and you fit the model using maximum likelihood, which uh, basically uses iterative computing to do the, the model fitting for you. Again, here we have a two-parameter model, but it could be more. And because likelihood uh, doesn't limit you to the number of parameters, you can do things like add random effects. You can estimate both process and observation uncertainty in your model. Um, you can do a wonderfully flexible number of things with your likelihood-based approach. And you make an inference based on the likelihoods. 
maybe you compare the relative likelihoods of two models. Okay, so in both these cases, we're relying on the likelihood. The first case is a special case of the second, where the sum of squares is basically a convenient method of calculating the likelihood when your data are normal. So the likelihood is the probability of the data given a hypothesis, okay? When we do a Bayesian model, on the other hand, we take a much different philosophical approach. But I'm trying to point out that maybe the math isn't as different as you might think. So in a Bayesian model, such as a Bayesian population dynamics model, which I'm about to show you, the data are what they are. We don't assume uh, a distribution. We fit them with Bayes' rule. But a, a big component of Bayes' rule is actually the likelihood. So the same term here is in Bayes' rule, okay? We can specify uh, hypothesized distributions for parameters in, in the form of priors. That's the thing that uh, Bayesians are most famous for. And we actually don't need a method of statistical inference. We just get a posterior distribution of our parameter. So a key difference there is that the parameter isn't fixed. It's, it's, a, it's seen as, as part of a distribution, coming from a distribution. And so Bayesian models are really great for fitting things like time series, where a parameter like, like birth rate might vary over time. Okay, importantly, Bayes' rule tells us the likelihood of the hypothesis given the data. So this is a subtle but big chasm. And this one is actually way more intuitive, right? We want to know something about a hypothesis given our data. On the other hand, we are trained very early on and very strongly to think about the likelihood of our data given a hypothesis. So uh, what that means is that people often view Bayes' rule with suspicion and they think of it as something, something like a Jedi mind trick where it's basically, um, you know, if you're using it, you're, you're, you're potentially doing something suspicious. Okay, so what I want you to take away from this little digression is that the sum of squares is a special case for calculating the likelihood. And also with weak priors, the likelihood will dominate Bayesian estimates of parameter values. So in that case, if we did a Bayesian linear regression, we would get exactly the same uh, or almost, depending on our computational uh, methods, almost the same estimates. We basically get the same answer with weak priors um, between a classic linear regression and a Bayesian model. Okay, likelihood-based models can address process error and observation error separately. So this is really important if you're like me, where you wanna do a state space model. This is where you assume that the states of your system, in my case, a population dynamic over time, are hidden, meaning that we don't directly observe them. We do have observations, but we have to have a separate model of observations. Um, people don't tend to do likelihood-only state space models. They almost always go the full Bayesian, but I just wanna point that out. Bayesian priors are an opportunity to provide information about covariance between parameters, about the data, and improve your model fits. So Bayesian models are so effective sometimes, they're incredibly easy to love. And as a cheeky aside, frequentists are often unknowingly using strong priors by assuming the data follow a given distribution and assuming the parameters are fixed. Okay, so to quote this book, uh, which I highly recommend if you're interested in more about the philosophy underpinning likelihood and Bayesian approaches. Um, we're all Bayesians, even if we don't know it. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's look at an example of a Robin Hood model. So my collaborator Jason and I did this model a few years ago, and we decided to use exactly the same population dynamics model that I showed you in the first half of the talk. So again, no difference. I'm doing this for a community of eight elasmobranchs, so skates, one stingray, and one angel shark, so mostly skates. 
that are um, found in the North Sea and the Northeast Atlantic. We did add envir an environmental covariate. So in this case, we're not doing a deterministic model. We have some noise that is driving the dynamics of our system. But trying to understand our Robinhood model, so we wanted to do this on simulated data. We then observed our own simulation with error so that we got something, a data set, that resembles something like a trawl survey, where you have species that are winking in and out, you have different detection probabilities, and you have a lot of noise and uncertainty you have to deal with. We then fit our Robin Hood model. So again, I'm fitting all eight species at once with a state space model. My species are, are related in a hierarchical framework according to their taxonomic distance. I'm showing you here two of the species of the eight. So this is just two examples. I'm showing you spotted skate, which is a relatively data-rich species. Every dot here is a data point. This is time, and this is a population abundance on the y-axis and angel shark, which is a data-limited species in this data set. We do not catch very many angel shark in our example. So what you can see is that with an uninformative prior, the prediction for my skate is actually pretty good. It's, you know, it's okay. Prediction for angel shark is dominated by the other species, the data-rich species in the data set. So we had some priors, and we added them. And something really remarkable happened. So basically, we were able to do a really fantastic job picking up the dynamics of angel shark. Uh, and we also improved our fit of spotted skate. So basically, when I saw this, uh, I think I knew my life was going to change. I th I think <laughs> So I, uh, I basically, this is the result that has gotten me out of bed every morning for the last four years, maybe. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit more about the priors that we did that achieved this magical result. Um, so here I'm showing you, we did a multivariate regression of three life history traits. So survival, which we assumed was the inverse of lifespan, fecundity, and age and maturity as a function of body size. Um, multivariate regression basically is the opposite of what we usually think of with multiple regression, where you have multiple predictors and one response. Um, but you, you essentially get a whole bunch of coefficients, and you can multiply those through with a normal distribution of body sizes for one of your species that you generated. So this is, this is based on the life history traits of the eight species. So if you multiply those coefficients through, you can generate a cloud of points that shows the relationship between your three traits. And I'm showing you different slices through that cloud of points. And that's the prior. It's really hard to look at a three-dimensional cloud in two dimensions and understand what is going on. But basically, for, if you look at it for a long time, you can see that if reproductive investment, meaning fecundity, is high, it is not possible to mature early without also trading off survival. So think about that upper right-hand corner of the quadrant, of the right quadrant that, that I said was inaccessible space evolutionarily. This prior is basically telling me exactly the same thing. Now, the prior looks different for species of different body sizes. So my, my blue species is small my, and my light blue species is large. But basically, they're both, they both are, have that same covariance. And that is what allowed me to fit the model so beautifully in this figure. So um, yeah. Currently, this project is in a state of progress. The data needs are where I spend most of my time, trying to gather the data needed to assess and forecast the trajectories of those three clades. Um, and I'm also trying to develop mechanistic life history theory for broadcast spawners such as tunas incorporating temperature and food availability. So those results aren't 
quite ready for prime time. Um, and then one of the things that my postdocs have done is uh, start to look at applications of this approach beyond fishes and fishing. So um, Kat is working on um, doing a Robin Hood approach for seabird colonies where you have some species that are, have several colonies that aren't monitored and others that are. Um, and maybe they share some environmental drivers and maybe they're even related species or they're different populations of the same species. But you can use the same type of approach. In fact, I think it's, it's becoming more and more common. But um, back to the data needs. So one of the things that happened relatively early on is we tried to collect the data we needed to do population models for our data-rich clade, the clade where we thought we had the best chance of having a higher proportion of data-rich species and having independent population trajectories that we could validate our model with. That was really important um, to us to, to be able to apply this approach uh, to, to real data, so to speak. So this is why we were working with the scombrids, the tunas, and specifically the seven principal market tunas. Like I mentioned, they are among the world's most productive, most economically important, um, and, and best monitored fisheries. We quickly ran into a gap in one of our key parameters. Tunas are batch spawners. That means that they, um, they spawn with a given frequency an indeterminate number of times um, in a season. So they, so I, but not all batch spawners do that, but tunas do. So they have this, this little habit called indeterminate fecundity. They're very um, responsive to the resources that they find when they're foraging. So if you feed them three weeks later, you'll, you will increase um, their reproductive output. But when you start to get a handle on, on a metric like mass specific reproductive output over a given amount of time, which is the kind of parameter that I'm really interested in, it just doesn't exist. And so what we, what we realized was, okay, we're gonna have to do a hierarchical data sharing model of the traits themselves before we can even fit a population model. And so this, so Kat spent a solid chunk of time working on this. Um, and she has some really amazing results. And we're already learning a few of the answers to the questions that I had um, regarding how much information we have in phylogenetic distance versus ecological similarity. So I just want to show you, whoops, we were able to, um, to, to fill in annual fecundity, which is a big relief. But the other thing we were able to do is try to predict the traits of species that are out of sample. So like, how, how far can we go to predict relatives that are congeners but aren't in our original data set? And the thing that we found was that the model, first of all, we validated the model um, within the data set, and then we tried with data poor species outside the data set. There aren't really any data rich species outside. Uh, we found that the congener Tunis Tongal, it's a, it's a coastal tuna in the Indian Ocean, we weren't doing such a great job um, capturing its dynamics, and our uh, credible intervals on our posterior parameter estimates were really broad. Whereas something like Spanish mackerel, which has quite a different lifestyle, but is also a pelagic scombrid, we were able to, to achieve much better, better model performance. Um, and so that's pretty technical, but I'm happy to talk about that more, and I think that paper will be in, out very soon, I hope. Uh, it, it's in press now. And um, yeah, so I just want to leave you with that. So in summary today, we've talked about how traits can be used to infer things like mortality and compensatory capacity. And specifically, I think the traits that I'm interested in are age maturity, fecundity, and body size. Uh, life history trait covariance can produce informative priors that improve population model fits. So I just spent a long time telling you about that. And in general, I think these eco-evolutionary perspectives can offer information we can use to assess and improve species fates in the Anthropocene. And with that, I would be very happy to take your questions. Um, you can find me. I'm around now a lot. I live, uh, I am, my office is Ian Arwin 29 and I'm, you can find me online.
Hi. One of the nice things about the Bayesian analysis is today's posterior tomorrow is prior. And as time goes on, you can, yeah, you can update. iterate the process. Yeah. How far along in that aspect of an argument at this point? <clears throat> Today's posture is tomorrow's prior. Yeah, so as more data come in, I think, I mean, that I feel like what you're suggesting is that we use our Bayesian estimates of a trait to feed into a model, and then we learn from the model whether that trait uh, makes sense, is credible. Is that? Well, there's a level at which when you use evolutionary distance yeah. to help you set the Prior. Yes. That's learning from prior experience. Yes. In, in, in the sense that if I had to go somewhere, that would be the place to go. Yeah. Having done that, could one then go out with the posterior we have at the moment as we learn more about fisheries, for example? Yeah, absolutely. Iterate our yes. way Yes, our absolutely. Prior Yes. Uh, anytime you have a new data source or even a new species, it changes your current estimates. And yeah, I think the answer is is yes. Um, <laughs> I do. I do want to be uh, more clear though. The evolutionary distance is in the hierarchical, so it's kind of a hyper prior, but it's not. I wouldn't say I have a posterior on evolutionary distance coming out of this model. No, I, I <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, look for a, yeah. Yeah. A model that you yeah. Something yes, absolutely. And and I should have said people do that uh, you know kind of ad hoc all the time. Of course, we have to. We we use sister taxa as a rep representative um, if if given no other choice. Yes. Yes. No, I mean, anytime you have, um, so I should say, I did not invent the term Robin Hood model, although I wish I did. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a paper in conservation biology a few years ago. Yeah, yes, everybody is using this approach now. I think the evolutionary angle is is the really novel thing that I found out, just because my background is in evolution. That's I'm I have a different background than the vast majority of people who are really worried about data poor species and and trying to model species trajectories and make forecasts. Does that answer your question? Um, so I saw a paper on on seals, I know it's still marine. So, you know, sometimes it's true, this is, goes back to Lotka of Volterra, sometimes people who are dealing with fish populations have to kind of get there sooner because the problems and the scale is more difficult. I don't know if that's a controversial statement, but might be that, in, that fisheries and marine systems are a little quicker to adopt these approaches just because of maybe the data are so crappy. <laughs> So, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's a push and pull. I mean, I agree with you. I've, I've, so I think Malin is referring to my go. Oh, I, I can't go. Hmm. Do you want me to go back? Malin is just referring to the slide where I have the the sort of um, cartoon graphs with a negative relationship between mortality and age maturity. Yeah, I strongly implied by putting juvenile mortality on the x-axis and. It's much more of a correlation. I don't think one is, is you can't argue, because you don't see those transitions. You know what I mean? <laughs>
Yes, so this is the adaptive dynamics paper that I did with Sally. So if you assume that you have selection for a larger offspring, because larger offspring compete better, you have to sacrifice your clutch size because you can't just produce a larger offspring out of nowhere. And so that strategy, the reason that people did not make theoretical headway on that problem for so long is because any model you do that does that is susceptible to cheating. Anytime you, re you reduce your clutch size so that your offspring compete better, you're going to get a cheater that makes larger offspring and doesn't have to compete as, or sorry, makes more offspring and they don't have to compete as much because you made fewer. The, the thing that we did, well, first of all, we did it in the density dependent sort of adaptive dynamics framework. Um, and it was almost like a game theoretic model and specifically linking offspring fitness to size, which is intuitive, but hadn't been built in before, um, gave us that result. I don't know if this answers your question, because you, I think you're asking about something which is, how do you have a, you know, an ESS model of an individual life history strategy, and then scale that up to species traits? And that, that sort of connection between microevolutionary, like we're, we're getting pushed to, to making larger offspring, um, and then suddenly we have, we have something like a bluefin tuna, which makes three million, literally three million you know, offspring. And I have estimates now for bluefin tuna for the annual fecundity that, that no one has. <laughs> and it's really high. But um, yeah, how do you get there? And I think that's a very chicken or egg kind of um, I'm I'm not willing to take a stance on that. <laughs> right. No. No. But I think Mail is asking something really deep about like how did diversity of life evolve? Yeah. So I mean, it, and it's like, um, yeah. There's an argument about bed hedging that has been made. There's many different arguments about environmental predictability. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, these are the questions. Like, I do not have the answers. No. But, <laughs> but I don't think I don't think necessarily other people do either. So, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs>